without further ado, I want you I want to introduce Steve Clements and Walt Mossberg. So. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Hello, you all. So, uh, one of my friends, I just want to say a couple words um, uh, before I get into the, the chat we're going to have with Walt. First, I love attending the annual Startup Growing Camp uh, Conference in, in California. Uh, I've always found it so refreshing to find out what sort of weird ideas all of you guys have that might have some potential to shake, you know, shake up things, uh, uh, be both profitable for you, but be very disruptive in cool ways for others. Uh, and so I really love going out there. And so we want to, I think Walt and I both want to try and build you into this. And, you know, this is intimate enough, possibly, that we can have a conversation so that uh, you're sitting with one of the real icons. You know, I'm a, you know, a journalist interviewing journalists is not particularly comfortable. I had to wait till he retired so he could achieve full icon status. Uh, and then, you know, it's a legitimate thing to interview you now. So, um, that's fair, right? Yeah, yeah but whatever, yeah. I keep never going to interview me. Uh, maybe in my retirement, uh, uh, Mossberg will interview me. But in any case, I, I, I thought what we could do is talk a little bit about, you know, some things that I, that I think are, because this is all about me right now, but we'll make it about you soon. Um, but the Walt's, um, in a way, I've known Walt Mossberg and of his work uh, longer than most of you have been alive in the sense that I remember he was, you know, I don't know what I can get away with saying on taped uh, video now, but he was the shit. Uh, and, you know, he was, but, but not in technology. He was the shit in uh, uh, covering national security issues. He was uh, the leading Wall Street Journal covering James Baker, uh, who was just, you know, he was the boss of that time. He was an extraordinarily significant person in American political and economic history. Uh, and Walt did uh, economic uh, issues and trade issues as well. Uh, and that was the time when he came under my radar screen. And I remember in the early 90s when he shifted, I was living in Washington at that time, he shifted, and I, and I was talking to a guy named Clyde Prestowitz. These are probably names you may not know, but they used to be big in Washington. Uh, and, and I said, yeah, he's doing this technology column. He's really big. And I said, wait, really? And so I was able to see from the very beginning how Walt made a, I want to ask you, like, how did that happen? Like, you were the biggest player, Wall Street Journal, National Security Economic Issues, James Baker feared you like Steve Jobs feared you, um, or liked you uh, like Steve Jobs liked you. And, and so what, what actually drove you, what gave you the inkling to know that this would be a positive path? Um, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> um, I have to apologize, I have a little cold, so. That's why I have two bottles of water here. Um, I was, uh, I always wanted to be a journalist. And I always wanted to be a journalist in Washington covering, you know, government policy and all that stuff. And I succeeded. I did that for about 20 years. And um, <clears throat> somewhere in the middle of that, I got very interested in computers, personal computers, really early crude personal computers. My first uh, uh, personal computer was called a Timex Sinclair 1000. Wow. Is there, is there anyone in this room that has ever heard of no, it? No, I've never heard of it. You have it? Two people. Really? Three people. I donated it to the museum. <laughs> um, it's a, uh, it, it, it cost 99 bucks. It had 1K. Not one gigabyte, not one megabyte, one kilobyte of, of uh, RAM. And um, for another 99 bucks, you could boost that to 16 kilobytes. Wow. And uh, it uh, didn't use floppy disks, let alone a hard disk, let alone the cloud. It used uh, cassette tapes. You had to buy an audio cassette recorder uh, and plug it in. And somehow the audio tone conveyed the bits and I don't know but um, uh, that's what I started with and I, it just became my hobby and I had no computer science I had no math background nothing nothing I it was all self-taught so my hobby for about 10 years and I realized I mean just to answer your question directly I decided this was you know the personal computer um, and the personal technology era began in 1977. That is the year the first computers, PCs came out that were um, usable by relatively normal people. In other words, you, you didn't, what they weren't, it wasn't a kit, 
you didn't have to uh, uh, write programs to use it. There were actually programs you could, there were word processors, there were spreadsheets, things like that. The most famous of the, the three of them came out in 1977, and the most famous and the one that lasted the longest was called the Apple II. Mm. And, um, that was my first. That was my second. After the Timex, I bought an Apple II for three thousand dollars, and and I three thousand dollars I didn't have. My wife was pissed. And um, uh, but I think, I think I paid five, and you got a discount. I, no, I didn't get a discount. I just you know, but the thing, and I was covering at the time. I was covering uh, the Pentagon. I was doing various regular beats at the Wall Street Journal as a journalist. But this was my hobby. And by around 1990, I decided that even though it had been 14 years since this had started, it really hadn't, if you looked at a curve, you know, the, the hockey stick curve, which is something going up very fast, it had just kind of moved along and it had grown a little bit, but it, it hadn't penetrated into every, every household, every corner, every economic class, everything, but it was about to. I thought it was going to explode. You sensed the inflection point. I sensed the inflection point. And so I didn't have any, any investment or any, any way to make money off it, but I, uh, I sensed the inflection point. And so, plus the national security stuff I was covering, we had, ju we had won or we were within th two months of winning the Cold War. <clears throat> the Soviet Union collapsing. It was a <clears throat> kind of the end of an era for that stuff that I'd been uh, covering for many years. And I thought, this is the next big deal in <clears throat> the life of the nation, the life of the world. And it's just way too hard for people to understand. The industry doesn't care about average people. And I sold the editors at the Wall Street Journal uh, on letting me write a column championing the non-techie hmm. average person and criticizing the industry for not serving that person. So the question I have next, because I think it's so important, you know, I'm in the incubators a lot, I meet fascinating people. Part of the culture that all of you are in has a lot of gee whiz, and wow, isn't that cool? There's a lot of hype that's built into it. But anyone that looks and has been a fan of your column over the years knows that you've managed to uh, have a lot of disdain for the hype, to uh, not be wow, to be able to temper the wow part of this. You're not easily bowled over by the uh, oligarchs, if you will, of the uh, high-tech industry. How were you able to, when you still were fascinated by this, not to get co-opted, not to get sucked in, into kind of a sycophancy for the industry? Well, I mean, look, I, I love gadgets, and I love great software, and um, and I always have, and I love seeing something beautifully designed, but the thing to me that mattered the most was, was it designed in such a way that a, a, a normal person could use it without reading the manual, without going through a bunch of, you know, belonging to user groups, and I, I, some of you don't even know what I'm talking about when I say user groups, but believe me, in this city alone, the, P, the Apple user group had 5,000, members and the PC user group had 10,000 members or something like that. I mean, people and people went there to learn how to use the things they had paid thousands of dollars for. And so I just I just got up in the morning and uh, uh, I knew a lot of stuff that uh, made me sort of a techie, but I um, put on a, a different persona. I looked at everything through a lens of a of a regular person, and <clears throat> one way I did that was to stay here. When the journal agreed to let me do this column, this is in 1991, um, they said, well, we'll, you, we'll move you to Palo Alto. Like, and I, it made sense, I understood that, <clears throat> but I said, if you move me to Palo Alto, I will get, I will see all the people that make this stuff in the supermarket. I'll be in the PTA meeting with them. I will, you know, whatever it is. You'll be corrupted. Well, I mean, it, happens, it happens with political reporters here. You get, it's not so much corrupted, it's not like you're taking payoffs, it's just that you become personal friends uh, with 
the people you're supposed to be writing, who's, in my case, products you're supposed to be writing about. And I wanted to feel like I could, um, in good conscience, represent only one, only one group, and that was the users. And that's what I did. You know, the other um, real innovation that you brought to this, along with your longtime partner in crime, Kara Swisher, is you began to see the power of 3D journalism in convening people, both writing but right. also engaging what we're doing. I call this 3D journalism. I, I'm a journalist, but sometimes journalism or content uh, can be in the content of a, uh, you know, a tough-hitting question, like, uh, you know, who was the worst interview you ever did, or what did you really think of uh, Bill Gates, or something like that. But, but I guess in the process, where did you, that's another inflection point I'm interested in, how did you and Kara see that convening would be such a powerful... So he's talking about Kara, I don't know how many know Kara Swisher or know the name. She uh, was at the Washington Post, she was covering AOL, I was also writing about AOL. It's hard to imagine, but when AOL was at its peak, uh, it was bigger than, even after the web yes. uh, came, came on the scene and web browsers came on the scene, AOL was for some years still the biggest deal in getting online. And um, it was located here in, in Northern Virginia. It was, it was, we had, it would be like if Facebook or Apple or something were located, its primary headquarters were in, uh, out near Dulles. That's where it was, you know, or in Bethesda or somewhere. You know, it, you don't think of a DC that way, but that, that, there was a time when it went, that was it. So Karen and I met each other because we were both covering it. And um, she was writing a book about how AOL had uh, risen. And she was interviewing me for the book because I played a little bit of a role in that by writing positive things about AOL when they were very small and outgunned by competition. And um, I recruited her onto the journal. She went out to the valley. We started going to a lot of tech conferences uh, uh, together. <clears throat> and we decided they all sucked. <laughs> uh, and the reason they all sucked was that they had a podium and they let these uh, CEOs of tech companies stand up there and make unanswered pitches about how great their product was and their company was. <clears throat> and sometimes they'd have one interview, they'd call it a fireside chat, but it was typically badly conducted and very softball. And we decided we could do a better job by having a conference with no keynote, no podium, no PowerPoint allowed, no, nothing but this kind Real of thing. Journalism. With an interview, we called it live journalism. And uh, we invited all of our competitors, and we charged a bunch of money, a lot of money, for the tickets. <clears throat> and the journal very reluctantly let us try this, and we made them a lot of money. Uh, eventually, we made some money for ourselves out of it, and that became a business that we ran in, while still writing at the Wall Street Journal inside of the company that published the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the conferences and a website, and uh, now they have a bunch of podcasts and other things. And, um, and we eventually left the journal and started a successor company that was independent, and then we sold that, ironically, to a company down the street, uh, Vox Media. And that's the Rico conference. It's, uh, it, it was called for 11 or 12 years the D, the D letter D conference, D for digital. But when we left, uh, we had to rename it. We renamed it the Code Conference. So if you ever see on YouTube or embedded in a tweet or in a story a picture of Mark Zuckerberg or Sheryl Sandberg or Jack Dorsey or Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or I mean, you just, you can name any tech mogul you want, Tim Cook, anybody, in a red leather chair. Hmm. Uh, that was kind of the iconic thing we had on our stage with these big, tall, lead, red leather chairs. And uh, all of that footage, or everything you've ever seen where Steve Jobs is doing Q&A with a journalist is with me 
and Kara, or sometimes just me, in a red chair because he didn't go to any other conference and answer questions. Wow. So let's just break that down for a minute. You know, and, and I want to uh, deal, get, get out of the history and kind of get into what you're doing now and sort of look at some of your concerns with what you call ambient technology and how this is all right. uh, evolved. But, you know, I think it would be very interesting for this crowd to hear about who you admired and who you didn't. Uh, in this field, and you clearly admired Jobs, and you clearly were the one of the people who saw something about Apple that was going to be life and society sculpting, and you saw it in ways that many other people didn't early on. So, just just in short form, what were some of the frames that you that, that resonated with you from the people you admired, and who do you think are the hucksters who really don't deserve the attention that they saw? Well, I think they all. I mean, the amount of hype coming out of tech is almost, almost it's, it's got to be, of all sectors of life, it's got to be right up there with politics in terms of just hype. Just immense amount of hype and bullshit and, you know, way over-promising and under-delivering is uh, a very common thing and has been common for 20, I did, I, I did my comp for 27 years. It didn't really change in all that time, that, that thing. Uh, yes, I admired Steve Jobs. I also admired Bill Gates, who was his mortal enemy. Um, I thought, uh, but when I say admired them, I admired their uh, foresight, their prescience in doing certain things. There were a lot of things about both of them I didn't admire. I had fights with both of them quite often. Neither of them was happy with every column I wrote, and, I, and the, neither of them hesitated to tell me, uh, including yelling. And when there were, there were yelling matches I had with them. But the thing is, I didn't, I was one of the few people who both, on the one hand, they were willing to kind of take into their confidence, because I was a reviewer and not a reporter. If you're not a journalist, this may not make any sense to you, but being a reviewer meant my, I was not being paid by the Wall Street Journal to cover the earnings or news about who lost a job or gained a job or what, who bought what company. I didn't have any of that responsibility. It was just all product evaluation. And so I could sit down with them and not have to write a story about whatever they said the next day. So they would take me into their confidence. And that was great. Uh, it also meant <clears throat> if they said something I thought was bullshit, I could say that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. And and if I wrote something that they thought was bullshit, they could tell me, and I we would have an argument about it, you know. And it was kind of an interesting uh, situation. But the reason that I uh, became relatively close to Steve Jobs was fairly simple. In addition to his uh, reality distortion field, you know, whatever you want to call it, his charm, which he had a lot of. Uh, Apple was the only big hardware maker that focused on the user. Microsoft and Dell and other companies that made, well, Microsoft didn't make much hardware in those days, but uh, all of them were focused on the IT department. Uh, an intermediate or the phone carrier, somebody who stood between them and the actual user, and they used the term, and you all know this term, end user. If you sit down and you talk to somebody in tech who says end user, they are not building something directly for the consumer. But Apple never said end user. They just directly, they assume that the person that bought their Mac and later their iPod and their iPhone and their iPad and their watch and all those things was the person that was going to use it. And it was the same person. And so since that was my uh, target in my column and it was Steve Jobs' target as a CEO, I got So you admire any, anyone you want to share on your, on your bad guy list or bad girl list? I'm not a big fan of Mark Zuckerberg. I'm not a big fan of Mark Zuckerberg. Um, obviously, he's very smart. Um, obviously, there are some good things about Facebook and certainly uh, Instagram. Some, if you haven't read the stories of exactly why uh, the Instagram founders are leaving Facebook, you should read it. 
Um, I'm not a big fan because I'm a big uh, proponent of privacy. I'm a big proponent of security. I'm not, I'm, I, I mean, I think the United States is in, is, is ridiculous for, not, for being the only advanced country in the West to not have a law governing, at least laying out in broad terms, uh, 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 what our policy is on privacy, what our policy is on security. We don't have laws like that. And I think Mark has basically made a fortune off you, and you, and you, and you, stealing your personal information. I'm going to repeat that, stealing your personal information. Uh, he would say, I'm not stealing it. They can turn the switch off. They can toggle this. They can do that. But a lot of his collection of your information it is done without your knowledge, let alone your permission. And um, so it's not that he's not smart. It's not that he's the devil. Uh, but I, I'm not a big fan. So, I mean, you've helped for so many people demystify tech. You've demystified it. You created pathways so that uh, people could understand what they were wrestling with or dealing with, and you could, you know, give thumbs ups or thumbs downs to to uh, various things. And I'm wondering if you feel like, given what you just said about Facebook, we might need that same kind of thing again. I interviewed the other day at the MIT Media Lab a guy named Nir Ayal, and he writes a, a blog called Near and Far, N I R and Far. And, and he wrote a book called Hooked, and essentially it's how, in part, how software makers um, in social media have figured you folks out so well that there are ways of, of bioengineering the software to get people hooked to certain sorts of, uh, uh, he would call them habits rather than addictions, I would call them addictions. But it raises these interesting questions about social responsibility, what the guide, you know, guardrails ought to be. And it's just from, from just knowing what you've written, I know that you have a lot of those concerns as well. And so how do we, uh, how do you suggest that folks here in startups, folks playing in this space, look at this and, and, and demystifying this next round of tech advancements? Well, the next round is much scarier than what we have now. You could be as upset as you want about Facebook and Twitter and any other unintended, con and these really are unintended consequences. I, I honestly think, I mean, I think Mark wanted to be rich, and I think he, he wanted Facebook to succeed. I don't think that even he foresaw all the consequences. And the same thing with, with Apple and Microsoft and Google and, and all the others. Um, I think, um, I think, well, First of all, to back up a little, I think we do have reviewers mm. who are skeptical, who are tough. Um, we just have, they, their voices tended, my voice tended to stand out because I was doing this in the days before there were 10,000 right. uh, other voices out there. Um, and there's obviously some positive, you know, a really a positive thing about having 10,000 uh, voices out there instead of five or six or whatever there were, 10 when I was doing it. But um, the negative is that uh, things get lost. I can name, I'm not going to do it uh, unless you insist, but I mean, I can name the names of people. No, but some, I, I, who I would this read. This also feeds into what you're doing now, right? This is yes. a book, this is yes. a news literacy project. So right. um, can you take us there? Because I, I do wonder if you are about to engage in playing that role again. No, I'm not, I'm done. I'm retired as a tech reviewer. I do a little, I do, I'm active on Twitter. I comment there on uh, some tech products occasionally. But um, I, look, I did it for 27 years and I decided it was time to not do it. What I am doing, the one reason I, re I retired when I did, when I was, I know that I don't seem young to any of you and I'm not young, but I'm young enough as compared to if I waited 10 more years to um, make a real contribution, I think, by, uh, uh, I'm on the board, I'm on the executive committee of the board of a organization based here called the News Literacy Project. We have a digital curriculum that is in use in all 50 states that in high schools and middle schools that teaches kids how to tell the difference between real news and fake news. Uh, 
it's, it's nonpartisan, so you won't, it doesn't say don't believe Trump or don't believe the Democrats or any of that stuff. It talks about, okay, you've got this story, seems pretty sensational. How can you tell if it's true or not? And there are ways to tell. And then it go, there's 14 lessons in this curriculum, and it goes on to puts them in the position of being a reporter. We create a scenario where something has happened in their community. They're a reporter. They have to figure it out. There are different witnesses. There are different accounts of what happened. They have to figure it out and write a fair story that comes as close to the truth as they can. We have another one where they're the editor. They're trying to put together a website. There's a bunch of stories. What do they pick to put on the website? And in the middle of their trying to decide this, we come in with another story that wasn't there at the beginning. It's breaking news. You have to figure out what to do about it. We teach about the First Amendment. Um, and <clears throat> I'm, uh, I, I go to Silicon Valley. I try to raise money. I have raised money from people there to try to educate kids about this because there's no civics in schools anymore. There's no critical thinking. And because, uh, uh, well, you all know the situation we're in where people are really confused about what to believe. Uh, we also, um, in journalism, have done a terrible job of explaining what we do to the people we expect to believe us. Uh, I think we've been way too opaque, and the News Literacy Project is trying to pull back the curtain on that. You know, I want to go to all of you in, in just a moment, but um, as you look at the terrain today and the political terrain of what's happening, and I know this concerns you somewhat, you've got a room full of people here that are in Washington that are uh, working their best on you know, some uh, entrepreneurial effort, maybe in healthcare, maybe in data, maybe in how to replace journalists um, right. uh, with machine. Uh, Learning, etc. You're doing that, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Not, yeah, right. <laughs> You're the I'm one. Get a robot up here to, to, to just, you know, whatever, whatever innovation they may look at. One of the things I've always been interested in, given your 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 survey, your long survey of this field, is the ecosystem that feeds it. And I'm wondering, you know, when you look at things like immigration, or you look at uh, investment in science, you know, which which is you know, different partnerships between universities and government and certain things, and the ability and kind of the freedom uh, to give people to run out and and pursue their passions privately and to uh, make them things like, you know, at universities, some of you may not know if you're academics, but the Bayh-Dole Act really changed uh, opportunities, not for just universities to have a share uh, of uh, the innovations and the profits that came from them, but also university professors. So there's an ecosystem out there that I think has had a lot to do yes. with a very rich uh, innovation culture throughout this. And I'm just, you know, wanting you to grade it where we are now. How, what worries you about that ecosystem that these folks should hear? Well, before I say what worries me, I'll just say um, I agree with you. I think it's not an accident that uh, Silicon Valley is uh, all located within a short distance of Stanford. Um, Stanford, is, is in some ways, was the incubator for a lot of this. Um, uh, Boston is another big center, and it's not a it's not a coincidence that MIT is there, and not to mention about 70 other universities. I think it's, um, I love Washington. I've lived here since 1973. I don't know how many of you were born in 1973, but I've lived here since 1973, and I think one of the things we lack is a world-class university, and that's not a knock on Georgetown or GW. They're both great uh, universities, AU. There's, they're all good but they're not Stanford and they're not MIT. We don't have that here. The closest we have is Johns Hopkins, and you all know that that's not in DC. Um, so it's great that we have a, a, a tech community, a startup community, a VC community here, and I'm, uh, this is not the first meeting of this kind that I've been privileged to speak at, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm glad it exists here. Um, so the universities have, have had a big uh, impact on this. Uh, I also think you get, uh, just like you get uh, lots of people who know about politics and policy here concentrated in this area, and they can go from job to job, sometimes 
from one party to the other or from one congressman or senator or, or agency to the other. You have this network in the valley. Some of you may have lived in the valley, I don't know, where there's a tremendous talent pool there. Um, and uh, um, all that is important. But what bothers me right now is the oligopoly. The oligopoly. We have five platform companies that are immeasurably rich and huge. And they're not all the same. They're, all, they're actually, it's not monolithic. They're different. They have different styles. They have different, you know, they overlap and they compete a little bit on the edges, but you know what they are. I mean, we have, it's, it's uh, Apple and Amazon, uh, Microsoft, um, Facebook and Google. And um, what worries me is that they are now so much larger than anyone else that it's very hard for a startup in a garage, which, was the, which is the mythology, based on a couple of real cases, um, uh, for that startup to become big and successful and to, and to get scale. Because what happens is either one of the big guys will build in your product as a feature into a platform that hundreds of millions or a billion people already have and kill you, or they'll buy you uh, and you won't be able to say and maybe no. maybe still kill you. <laughs> well, and maybe still kill you, but I mean, point is, at some point, as just as a fiduciary matter, even if that you didn't start your company to quickly exit, and I don't want to cast any aspersions to this group, but there are too, I think there are too many people who start companies with the principal goal of getting out and getting rich quick. That's not what Steve Jobs did. That's not what Bill Gates did. That's not what, uh, what Larry and Sergey did. It's not what they did. I mean, they got rich, and they're happy to be rich, but they didn't start the company with the goal uh, they never had a discussion about an exit. They never had a discussion about an exit. It just wasn't part of what they were doing. Today, if you're, if you're Instagram, there's lots about Instagram you can read today, and it's all worth reading if you're doing a startup. All worth reading. Um, those guys were bought, as you know, by Facebook. They have about a billion users now. And Facebook paid $22 billion for it, which is, um, uh, I mean, uh, you can't even conceive of it. And it's fantastic. But what might they have been on their own? I don't know. Some people might say, well, look, they wouldn't have been as big because they wouldn't have had the help of Facebook. But maybe they would have been a serious competitor to Facebook. You just don't know. What happens is, and it happens in smaller ways, too. So there was a company called Texture. It was a very small company. I can't remember how, how many people. Um, and, it, and it's like Netflix for magazines. You paid a monthly fee, and you got access to 200 magazines. You have to subscribe to them separately. They were all you know, digitally delivered to you through an app. And Apple bought them and is integrating it into Apple News. And uh, it's not necessarily a terrible thing, but kind of disappearing. You wonder. You wonder. So I think we have a problem of concentration of power, and our antitrust laws don't really apply to most of it, maybe to Google and right. search, but not to most of it. So that this, bothers this, me. This reminds me, I recently uh, interviewed an incredible woman who is uh, one of the co-founders of one of the leading robotics companies, uh, who <coughs> shared with me that Google went out and was going to get into robotics and literally bought all the American robotics companies they could. Uh, as a way to kind of create synergy. Yeah, Andy Rubin did it yeah, and, after and, he left Android. Yeah. Right, and, and, uh, and she said it really killed robotics and it set them back so far that we're really not the leaders in the, here anymore because of the buy and kill or the buy and stagnate uh, problem. Well, I assume Google it. would like to. No, Google would like to, but nonetheless, she was using it as an example of yeah. the failure of this. Well, I think we need, that. I think we need, uh, I'm not saying anybody should be broken, anybody in particular should be broken up. I don't know what the solution is. I did write, uh, in the months before I retired, I wrote a column in which I laid out what I thought was a, govern a government solution 
to the internet, to protecting the internet, and to and to dealing with the oligopoly that was as light touch as I could think of. And you can all look it up and read it in your spare time. And I know you don't have any spare time, but um, so there's stuff we can do. But um, that worries me. Well, thank you. We have. I mean, I could go down so many different roads with Walt for literally hours and hours and hours. Uh, we did have a long airplane ride back to California one time, and I got to do that without an audience, which was nice. But let's make this about you guys. Let's open up to questions, comments. Uh, yes, right here. Um, and tell us who you are. Are we gonna? Are we gonna? I guess we're not gonna take mics out to people, right? Or should I take here? I'll just take the mic to you. Okay. Great. Right, this gentleman here. Thank you. That way, we have millions of people watching online right now. So I'm now old. I've been around startups for a while. I've worked in tech for uh, since the 90s. Um, you alluded to it a couple of times, sorry, this will take a second to frame, but around kind of the big five and also sort of where all that's going, you know, right. probably, and now we're here in Washington. So obviously Facebook has an office here, Google has an office here, everyone's kind of moving there. They all have an office here. Yeah. Or that they were, they have lobbyists. I don't think a lot of people realize this. Amazon is already one of the biggest defense contractors. There's a $10 billion defense contract that's coming up. In a They're not one of the biggest defense contractors. They're not. They may have a big, what seems to you like a big defense contract, but you've got to remember that one F-35 fighter sure. costs yeah. you know, a huge amount of money. A but small country. Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> so it's moving in that direction, and, and more and more and more, and they're like, they're getting more into Jeff Bezos, owns the richest, most expensive house in D.C. now. Like, they're coming here. I'm just curious how you feel about that, or you think that's going like, yeah. not the outside. Thank you. Thank Good question. I think it's really interesting. When I started covering these guys, and um, I knew I knew Bezos, I knew Larry and Sergey, I knew a lot of these people when they were just starting out their companies, uh, and I followed them all these years. And for many many years, all these companies, the exception of Microsoft, which because of the antitrust case had to pay attention to Washington. All of them wanted to ignore the government, the state government and the federal government. They might have had one lobbyist or just hired a law firm to represent them here. They wanted nothing to do with it. They, they actually thought they were living on an island that wasn't part of, you know, subject to any government. And, um, and now they're, they're just like any other industry. You know, when I first arrived in Washington in the 70s, and I was getting to know the place, and I walk around downtown. I would go into buildings. I know this sounds bizarre, and I would look at the list of tenants. And sometimes the whole building was uh, was occupied by um, an entire uh, trade association, the National Association of Broadcasters, the Coal Miners Association, that kind of thing. Sometimes it was a union, whatever. But these were all in Washington to lobby the government. Uh, and the tech companies are just being like that. They're just like the oil industry now, or the car industry, or the coal industry, or the AFL-CIO, or uh, anybody else. They have, and they have a right to, and it's been going on for 150 years. So they all have lobbying offices here, those that can, and if they can't afford their own, they have associations. You all know about CES, the big, Absolutely. Yeah tech show in Las Vegas, which I hate, by the way. Um, it's run by the Consumer Technology Association over in Virginia, which is a lobbying organization for consumer technology companies. And that's not new. It's been around quite a while. It used to be called CES, like the show, and now it's called CTA, but yeah. Great question. Yes, in the very back. And I'm going to bring this to you just so that they can uh, hear you here. I'm not the one doing the speaking. I'm talking to Cameron. Hi. Yeah. Um, so this is not the issue of oligopolies. AT&T arguably was an oligopoly that contributed. No, AT&T was a monopoly. Well, a monopoly. It was one company. Yeah. Yes. But an oligopoly is multiple companies. But yeah, go ahead. But Keep it was going. More than one company. Uh, it no, it was, one. it was one company. It was yeah, broken up into five companies. It broken, but it, had, it influenced more fields than any of these companies mm. that exist now. Mm. The most, most I don't know. Fundamental engineering yeah. and applied science. You're talking about Bell Labs? 
Yeah. Yeah. But, but the whole company was like that. My question is, scale in itself is not a bad thing. Right. There's been no replacement to Bell Labs, right. for instance. Uh, research right. has been tremendously hindered by the breakup. Other things have been... Oh. I disagree. I'm sorry, I disagree so with you. So that's well, your, well, that's your, I mean, we're going to make your question and we're going like, to... The question it. is, when does these things become bad? Right. Great. Great. That's, a great, that's a good question. Now, I'm not an antitrust lawyer, and I'm not an antitrust trust expert, and so I have to preface what I have to say by that. So you're right, scale is, is not necessarily bad, and in fact, you know, being a monopoly, even if you're a, a, a fully qualified as a monopoly, that is you have 90 something percent of the market or whatever, even that is not illegal. It has to do with how do you use your monopoly power. And um, I would argue that the oligopoly, for some of the reasons I tried to explain, is not a healthy thing but, but the question right is, now. Is why did Bell Labs, at t use their monopoly, their scale for good? Which they really did. And no, they didn't really. They didn't really. Thank you, guys. As, as the moderator, I think you disagree. I think you have a perspective that you thought there were a lot of net goods that, flew, that came from this, like Bell Labs. I think oh, there are others. I, I was very close. Let me just finish. I was very close to AT&T in the 80s and 90s, and I saw Bob Allen and many of the people that were constantly reorganizing this. And they were received because of many anti-competitive behaviors. And I remember when, when Intel Corporation was being chased for anti-competitive behaviors. And I remember being with Eric Schmidt one time when the FTC was beginning to open a file on, uh, on Google uh, at a time and said, this is a, this is a uh, badge of honor because it means we're becoming powerful and significant. And so it's an interesting question, but I, you know, and, and, and won't do this, but I would say, as, as somebody listening to both of you, I think you have a friendly disagreement. I think we should move on, but I, let me just say one thing. I don't disagree with you necessarily about Bell Labs, and I don't want to get into I don't, I don't want to get into that. But I will just, just here's what I'll tell you: there was a day in the Carter administration when um, Supreme Court ruled against AT&T that it was legal for Americans to buy their own handsets, their own landline phones. AT&T had not only a monopoly on all telephone service in the United States, they had a monopoly on all telephones. And phone booths. And phone booths. They owned a company called Western Electric. It made the only place you could buy a phone and legally use it in the United States or any other device on the phone network was it had to be made by AT&T. But they also and Wait a minute, wait, just wait a minute. We're done, I'm sorry. And so the court said, we're separating this, we're breaking this up. Uh, they didn't actually break up AT&T in that ruling, they just said, you can buy your own phone. And AT&T had been lying. They had said the network will be damaged and destroyed if other people can make phones. And suddenly phone stores sprung. This is, I'm not talking about cell phones, I'm talking about landline phones. So AT&T wasn't, it had its bad side. Yeah. And it's not necessarily different with cell phones today. No. <laughs> So uh, I am, uh, my name is Deb Chandler, and I'm the Cape Media Group, and we are part of Active Entertainment and Active Corporation. Mm -hmm. And we have question. been, yeah. So the question is, is you scare the hell out of me about the, the big guys stifling companies, because we've met with all of them, mm -hmm. all of them. And it's, um, it, it, it's very scary. Do you really, do you really think <laughs> that they're stifling a lot rather than buying? Thank you. Well, I think they're doing both. I mean, look, there's still a lot of startups, and some of the startups will succeed. Um, I mean, nothing's 100%. I don't think these five companies meet in a room and plan strategy. I think they actually, there's a lot of competition among them, and they dislike each other. Uh, I've sat. One-on-one uh, -on -one with the CEOs of these companies, and they really dislike each other in a lot of cases. But I do think what's going on is that they have, you know, I used to think Microsoft was a big company uh, 20 years ago. It's nothing. Uh, these are gigantic companies 
with hundreds of billions of dollars in cash in some cases. And um, if they see something promising, they will buy it, they will take the product off the market, they will hire the engineers that will try to integrate it, and it will, um, they, sometimes they shut it down and sometimes they just fold it into their platform. These are, the thing that distinguishes these are their platform companies. Yeah, you Ron. Yeah, I, was, uh, I had a question about founders that you've met over the years and how they approach product. Um, is there anything in particular that you've seen in a good uh, founder group through how they approach a product and like things that you see that um, that's common about that being successful? Building? I think it would take a couple of hours for me to really fully discuss this, but uh, this is just my opinion. It probably doesn't agree with what Harvard Business School teaches or something, but I think at least in tech, I don't know other industries, but at least in tech, the companies that are going to be more successful than the other companies are the ones that are at least founded and run for a good, good while by a product person, not a salesperson, not a finance person. Now you need a super strong uh, a salesperson, you need a super strong operations person, you need a super strong finance person. Best example I can think of, and you probably, look, some of you know this, so Steve Jobs was a product person, and the, I really honestly believe that was a big reason Apple was able to be saved, turned around, and, and go on to be a big deal. After Scully? Or after, after, he, after Jobs yeah. came back, yeah. after Emilio. But, the whole time, or, or within a year, he hired Tim Cook. Tim Cook was an operations guy. So Steve Jobs could sit around with Johnny Ive and figure out the design of the iPod Nano or the iMac, figure out the engineering. He wasn't an engineer and he wasn't a designer, but he was a fantastic, he could see the next thing and he was a, an editor, a curator, and he had a team. But he did not have to worry about locking up the supply of memory chips, locking up the supply of screens, locking up the supply of, of uh, whatever part of the thing they needed, because Tim Cook did that. Tim Cook did that for 14 years, and he, he built this phenomenal supply chain that they still have. And that may seem boring to all of you. So let me just repeat. I think it's, the, it's best, at least in the beginning, there is a point at which you run into the kind of the founder syndrome where the company is too big and has too many uh, stakeholders for the founder to really keep running it. And you have to find a way to keep, if you can, to keep using the skills of the founder and have somebody else run it. I personally trust companies more, at least in the early years, if I think the CEO is the founder mm -hmm. and is, a, I mean, is, not the founder, and is a product guy and understands, or a product woman, and understands the product. That's the important thing to me. Right here, we're gonna go real quick with a few, yep. and then we'll go, yeah. Um, in your final uh, column on The Verge, you talk about ambient computing being the future right. of computing. Yeah, we never and, talked about that. And, uh, and, and it really being able to be able to anticipate your needs. Right. Um, how does that sit um, in the direction the industry is heading with privacy? Uh, you've got companies like right. Google and Amazon. So we're going to go short, so yeah. I appreciate that ambient computing concern. So what, what I mean by ambient computing, really short, is just that the title of that column was The Disappearing Computer. I still believe it. Mm. It's a 10 to 20 year thing. Um, if we met in this room in 10 years, 12 years, uh, everybody in this room has a phone. Some of you have a laptop or a tablet or something else. Not going to need that stuff. The ceilings, the floors, the walls, the chairs, the, your clothing, everything's going to have sensors and processors and, uh, you know, there's, it's, it's going to be ubiquitous. We're all going to be wired. In. And we're heading for the Star Trek Enterprise computer. Uh, I'm not trying to be a, a corny or making a joke, but that's what we're heading for. And if you don't know what I mean by that, go back and watch some old Star Treks. Anywhere in this room, you could just shout out into nothing a question. It could be the most mundane question. And, and I'm not talking about the kind of questions that Alexa <coughs> or God knows Siri can answer today. Even at the, on their best moments, I'm talking about really complicated questions, being able to carry on a conversation. This is real. This is going to happen. When you combine it with AR, which is also happening, 
I could be here as a hologram and be fairly realistic and I could be giving this talk all over the world without getting on an airplane. And we're really not far from that. This has been, this, this has already been um, uh, used in limited circumstances. It's going to happen. Um, and you, you, if I may, you have provocatively called for uh, intensive uh, code, uh, essentially the codification of rules and specs, yeah. the so, serious dimensions of this as if it were infrastructure, buildings, yeah. roads. Treat the internet like the national parks or like any other national asset. We need a lot of regulations. We need a lot of, bro uh, a, a lot of guardrails. Right. We need laws. It has to be laws passed by Congress, not some right. thing the FCC does under the Republicans and then they change it under the Democrats and they change it under the Republicans. We need laws. We probably need an all new agency that just deals with this on a case by case basis. Yeah. We're, back there. we're just out. Yes, we can go Stephen and then right here in the very back. Yeah. But I'm going to ask very brief questions. So. Yeah, so, very brief, like um, 30 seconds. Okay. You were an innovator, but when you were innovating at first, you were in another company, like a parent company. And we keep talking about all these oligopolies. There are DCs. It's a great place to talk about it. And even here, like let's look at the sun, right? Started grind from Google mm -hmm. and hosted by Verizon. Right? But when we think of innovation, we think of bootstrappers. And I see uh, there's a lot of tension with young people, especially who are trying to start something. Mm. How do you navigate this kind of new environment of, you know, you might have to work under a parent company. Should we be going to the parent companies? Should we be going to Congress and saying, hey, why is all the capital in the hands of the few? Is that well, I think we should be doing both. I'll just quickly say, and again, I could do a long talk about this, but I think everybody needs to understand that you can be entrepreneurial inside a big company. Uh, I eventually quit with, with Kara and we started our own company, but for 12 years we uh, operated autonomously a business unit that we invented, that we ran inside a big company. And as long as you work out the right kind of deal where you have autonomy, we actually had a 20 page written or 30 page written contract with our own employers. Uh, about them keeping their hands off what we were doing and a whole bunch of other conditions. And we delivered for them. Uh, we had no equity because it wasn't a separate company, but it worked. And then we went and had equity and had our own company. But it was all based on what we had done inside the company. So you could be entrepreneurial inside of a big company. You just have to believe in yourself. Uh, yes, right here. And we're going to make this the last question. Hey, you've been interviewing so many uh, over some of the likes and dislikes, what were my likes and dislikes with Steve Jobs? Oh, um, well, my biggest dislike with um, Steve Jobs was he was always trying to break the rules of the conference. So the conference uh, was uh, the rules of the con two of the key rules of the conference. One was we didn't give you the questions in advance, and we decided what to ask about, and you didn't get to decide if you were the if you were the mogul, if you were the Bill Gates or the right. Steve Jobs right. or the Mark Zuckerberg or whoever, Sergey Brin. And Steve would call me, he would agree to do the conference, and then a week before the conference, he would call me or have his PR person call me and say, Steve, there are the following four things Steve was going to refuse to talk about. He doesn't want you to bring them up. It was like a ritual. I mean, I don't know why he did then it. Then you're absolutely forced to bring them up. Well, I was going to, I mean, my, and I would say, and they would always be the newsiest things that had just happened that were a little embarrassing or that whatever. And I would just say no. And I would say no. And he never pulled out of the conference. Uh, PR person would call me and say, look, you know why I'm making this call. I have to make this call. Here's the, <laughs> here's the thing. I'm going through the mud. I, I want to be able to say I, I made this call. I say, OK, go ahead. What are the things he doesn't want to talk about? These four things, five things, whatever they are, I say, well, we're going to talk about it. We're going to reserve the right to talk about all of them. And we usually did. And he actually knocked it out of the park on, on those things. The other thing, uh, there's lots of positives. I don't have to go through the positives. He was a, you just watch the, go, go on YouTube, watch any clip of him from our conferences. And he's just, like every year he, that he spoke, he was voted the most, uh, the favorite speaker by the people. Um, but the other thing he did was, 
he always wanted to use slides. If you ever watch one of his product presentations, it's all slides, right? It's black background, white type, that's the giant slides. I mean, the whole keynote product that Apple has was actually invented for him because he didn't want to use PowerPoint. He didn't think PowerPoint was good enough. And uh, then they eventually made it into Keynote, into a product. But at first, it was just, it had no name. It was some engineered for him. So uh, every time he would agree to come, I would remind him that slides were not allowed. Gates got mad at this, too. Gates once said to me, I own PowerPoint. <laughs> you're, you're telling me I can't use PowerPoint? I said, yeah, that's what I'm telling you. And so I would say this to Jobs. And one year, out, this is the last story, one year, I walk into the ballroom, it's a big fancy resort hotel ballroom, and there's, there's three Apple vice presidents in the ballroom and a bunch of people that work for me, staff, conference staff. One of my people comes over to me and says, you know, Steve Jobs is backstage, he has 55 slides and he's got a bunch of assistants with him and they're going through the slides and they're rehearsing them. I said, God damn it, I, you know, I just told him last week that he can't, I reminded him, again, it wasn't his first time, it was his fourth time or something, and I said, can't use slides? And he said, okay, all right, yeah. So I go back, so I go over to one of the Apple vice presidents, and I say, I understand Steve is, is planning to use slides. And she says, uh, you know, she, she just wouldn't, you know, answer. And I said, well, go tell him he can't use them. She goes, oh, I'm not telling him that. <laughs> and then I go over to the other Apple vice president, almost exactly the same thing. He said, you're going to have to do it. So I go backstage, and there he is. Sure enough, he's got a whole bunch of slides. And I say, um, we talked about this. There's no slides here. It's, a, it's an interview. It's like this. You know, it's an interview. There's no slides. He goes, oh, I thought you said there's no PowerPoint. These are Keynote. <laughs> I said, come on. So he dropped it. He just gave me that little devilish smile he had, and he dropped this it. This is, I mean, I just want you, this is the sense of the rich. We're, we're, I'm sorry, we're, you know, we can all talk afterward, but, but we've got to bring this to a close. But you're getting a sense of the rich tensions that are part of really smart, cool journalism. And as we drop Steve Jobs' name or uh, other you know iconic names out there. I just want to you know pay one little tip of the hat that many of us in journalism look at uh, Walt Mossberg at that same level in terms of oh. you know we do. I mean it's I'm not like to be you know you know be, but maybe I want to be the Walt Isaacson of the Walt Mossberg story someday. We'll see. But you know in any case I do think that uh, as you guys are thinking about disruption, as you're thinking about what you're doing, um, it's very worthwhile to go back and read. Uh, Walt's columns over the years as you saw industries happen as things come on. There are enormous insights. I did this the other night of going back just on an early search at just early things that we're writing and there's so much relevant to then as you saw new gadgets coming forward and how to think about users and what we were doing and, and I think sometimes we forget that. So anyway, many thanks to Walt Mossberg uh, and any of your PR agencies. Take his advice, do not tell journalists what not to talk about. I get this all the time, and it ensures that I do ask those questions. So, Walt, thank you very much. Good luck to everybody. Stay strong.